Good evening. How are we doing so far? Good. Small crowd, but that's because most of the parents just dropped the kids off. And there's also a First Communion parents meeting tonight, so we're going to have a whole lot less adults here tonight. That means we get to get nice and cozy and comfortable talking about hope, um, because that is our topic that we're uh, carrying over from the last semester. But as always, before we begin in class, let us begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving this day for all of the reasons for our lives, for all of the opportunities of hope that you put into our lives, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Help us to see your word, to hear your word, and to speak your word of truth, of life, of peace, of hope. Watch over us during this time. Watch over all of our teachers and all of our students this evening, both here in the adult classes and the First Communion parents meeting and in all of our religious education this evening. Watch over um, all of our parishioners. Be with us, keep us safe, and help us to have a great conversation this evening about the virtue of hope. We ask all these things in your Son's name as we pray together in the words that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you want the light on in the cry room? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Much better. Um, so last semester, we started talking about the theological virtues. We went through faith and took almost the whole semester talking about faith, because it's one of those great gifts that God gives to us. Um, this semester, we're going to continue from our last class that we had back in December, talking about hope. Um, and when we, when we talk about hope, we aren't just talking about, I hope that something happens. It's not just wishing something can happen, but we're thinking about hope on the grand scheme. We're thinking about it in theological terms, that when St. Paul says to us, faith, hope, love, love remains, he's talking to us about when the Lord calls us home, the only thing that's left is love. Why? Because God is love. Faith is what helps us to embrace the truth, what helps us to live out and to understand who God is, who we are, and who everyone and God is to us. Hope gives us sometimes that extra oomph that we need, for lack of a better way to put it, to truly put into practice and put into our scope what really matters in life. It's not about the arguments. It's not about I'm right, they're wrong. It's not about they always think they're right and I always think I'm wrong, blah, 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 blah. It has nothing to do with anything about that. When we talk about the virtue of hope, authentic hope, we're talking about hope in the fact that everything that we believe in faith is actually true. Everything that we hope in, in God, when we die, will be proven. Or, from the alternate side, will be disproven. We as Catholics believe that everything we've been given through the tradition of faith is true. Um, if you're doing uh, the catechism in a year, is anybody doing the catechism in a year podcast? It's a little tedious at times, I know. We're on day 11 today. Um, but they were just talking yesterday and today about apostolic tradition. When we talk about hope, we talk about tradition and we talk about Scripture, kind of the two lungs of the church. Scripture, which has been written down, but also that we are people not just of the book, but people of the Word, the Word of God spoken into existence and spoke existence into being. We see that in the creation story in the book of Genesis but also that same word of God that is handed down over time, that is eventually written down, that after the revelation of Christ, the word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us, happened with the incarnation of Jesus. And after he lived his passion, his death, and rose from the dead for our sins, for us, he then 
continues to provide us this tradition that has been handed on from his resurrection and ascension into heaven until the popes that we have today. Um, One of the things I've been doing um, with the beginning of this year is listening to more podcasts about the faith, but also I've been listening to the um, biography of Pope Benedict. If you get an opportunity, if you have an Audible account, I highly recommend um, getting that book. Uh, It's a two-parter. I'm on part one. I'm 24 and a half hours into the 30-hour book. Um, But it talks a lot about um, his perseverance in the midst of an extremely chaotic world, that a lot of the things that we take for granted when it comes to our faith, he was actually a big instigator behind. The term, the body of Christ, members of the faithful, things like that, where it's like, we well, yeah, members of the body of Christ. We hear that from St. Paul, right? We, we, there are many parts, one body, it all works, right? These are new, real um, revelations to us in the last hundred years that God is a personal God. Um, we knew that through Jesus. We knew um, through his revelation, through scriptures, that we were to call God Father, to call him Abba. But beyond that, there was still this big disconnect for many people in the first few centuries of the Catholic faith. Um, and so, really throughout the last few hundred years, there hasn't been a new revelation, but it's been revealed to us in a different way so we can understand differently as we grow up. Think about it in in these terms. When you're five years old and you hear about God, you have a conception of God. When you're 10 years old, it kind of grows a little bit. 15 grows a little bit. 20 grows a little bit. 25 grows a little bit. And as you get older and older and older, your ability to understand and grasp reality is different as an adult than it was as an adolescent, than it was as a preteen, than it was as a child. Think about that in a larger scope of history, say 7,000 years of history, and we look at God being the same yesterday, today, and forever, but our ability to understand and comprehend who he is as the body of Christ has slowly began to make a little bit more sense as our brains can comprehend things at a different scope and different level. If I were to, to anybody over the age of 25, make the dial-up internet sound, you would know what that was. Like, Like, first of all, Father, that was a horrible representation. But you would pretty much know, okay, he's trying to dial into dial-up internet. Awesome. If you do that to anyone under 25 years old, they're like, what is that? What is going on? It's not that we understand something different, but that the world that we grow up in has different abilities to recognize things on different levels based on where we are. Does that kind of make sense? Following me so far? So when we talk about hope, G.K. Chesterton says, as long as matters are really hopeful... Hope is a mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength at all. Let me read that one more time. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is a mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength at all the exact opposite of what you think. You think when you have everything, that you have all of this need for hope, right? We have all of these desires. But when we look at the old adage, there are no atheists in a foxhole. You guys heard that before? Anybody heard that before? A couple people? The older people? Oh, no. I'm old in heart. No, so there's that old saying, um, there are no atheists in a foxhole. A foxhole, for those that don't know what it was, was what they would dig as far as digging trenches in World War II. You would be in there, and you'd be basically in a trench. You know what a trench is, right? Big hole, big lino holes that then you would peek your head up over and shoot or guard that area. The reason they say there's no atheists in there is because when your life is on the line, you will go to any deity that you can just in case. So there's that old saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole because... You have to hope for something to get you through life, to get you through the chaos of everything going on around you. You have to have something to 
grab onto. And so when G.K. Chesterton says, as long as matters are really hopeful, which in our world today, we feel a kind of despair around us, don't we? Um, I don't know about you, but I haven't watched the news in, well, I used to be able to say in a decade. It's actually been closer to about a month and a half because a lot of things happened at the end of the, end of the year. I had to look at, see what was going on in the war this last year with Russia and Ukraine because I've got friends that live over in that area and invested interest spiritually. Um, um, as there's a lot of, some of my priest friends or my priest support group have brother priests that they went to seminary with or that they've worked with that are actually in Ukraine trying to help. Um, we actually have, have, has anybody in our par- here heard of Kid Catholic? If you listen to our uh, radio station that we have, the Catholic radio station here, every day at, it's either 2.55 or 3.25, it's either right before or right after the D- Divine Mercy Chaplet, there's five minutes with Kid Catholic. Well, he's actually a parishioner at St. John the Baptist in Edmond, um, and a, a, a graduate this year from uh, St. Mon- St. Monica's, from Mount St. Mary's High School in Oklahoma City. But um, they had actually been in the process of adopting someone from Ukraine when all of this happened. And so they've been very <laughs> prayerfully and emotionally invested in what's going on there. Um, and so trying to keep tabs on that um, as well. But what Chesterton's talking about isn't that true authentic hope. He's talking about something to live for, something to have as a desire. But when we talk about authentic hope, it's more than just something to live for. It's something to strive for in our lives. Hope has an infinitely larger perspective than does just mere optimism. We don't just hope for the best and prepare for the worst, which is something that I say all the time. Being a former Boy Scout, being a military brat, that's like my modus operandi. That is my mode of operation. I'm going to hope for the best but prepare for the worst. But that's not really what we talk about when we talk about this virtue of authentic hope. Hope's perspective is eternal, whereas optimism is limited to the here and now. Hope comes to life when the night is the darkest, long after optimism has given up the ghost. So even when we are in the midst of despair, look at it through Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they give me comfort. I take a personal affinity to that psalm and to that verse because when I was in the shadow of my own doubt. Um, I was going into high school. Um, I've told this story, I think, here before. If I haven't, um, if I have, sorry, I'm repeating it. If I haven't, look out. Um, Between eighth and ninth grade, I was a very depressed kid. Um, I had started cutting. I still have some of the scars on my wrists, actually, from when I was a cutter, because I was very depressed. I thought the world sucked. I thought that there was no hope, that there was nowhere to go. And so, the spring of my eighth grade year, um, our parish had Uh, offered an opportunity to go to Catholic Heart Work Camp, um, which is a mission trip for a week long. Uh, They were going to Phoenix, Arizona. What I heard was, I'm going to be a day's drive from my family and not have to deal with the crazy chaos of being with my family. Because as as an eighth grader, you think that your family is the worst thing in the world, right? And so I thought, yes, I want to go. I want to get away. I want to get away. I want to get away. I didn't think I want to go serve. I didn't think I want to have a personal encounter with God. I thought, if I don't get away, I'm going to take my own life. And I was very serious in those notions at that moment. I was borderline suicidal as a teenager. And so I didn't see any hope. And in the midst of my hopelessness, Psalm 23, that I just recited for you, came into my life in a new way. We went to Mass at a church in Mesa, Arizona called St. Timothy's. It's the church where Life Teen started, the program that we have with our high school kids, Life Teen, and with our junior high kids, Edge. This is the parish that founded it in Mesa, Arizona. Their music director at the time was a guy named Tom Booth. You probably have never heard the name, but if you've ever heard any more contemporary um, Catholic hymns at Mass, you may have heard of him. Um, none of them are coming to me right now. Cry the Gospel is one that he sang. Um, I Will Choose Christ, him and a couple others sang. Um, but he had sang this version of the psalm of Psalm 23 that Sunday. And again, I went on this mission trip to go hang out with my friends, be away from family, and kind of like as a last-ditch effort 
before I came back and there would be no more Danny. I went away that first night that we were there, went to Mass there. And the responsorial psalm, the refrain, went to Life Teen that night because they had a life night afterwards. And we sang it together for like five, ten minutes and like had the whole arm thing going back and forth. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. And it's repeated and repeated and repeated. I am 37, almost 38. To this day, if I am afraid, that's where I go. In fact, two nights ago when I had a nightmare at 2 o'clock in the morning, immediately I woke up singing it because that is my safety blanket as an adult because in the midst of my darkness, in that foxhole, that's where the Lord spoke to me. So much so that six months later, I remembered that refrain so vividly that I could sing it to my parents and they found the CD. That's how old this story is. They found the CD. MP3s didn't exist yet. And for Christmas that year, I got the greatest hits of Kathy Tricoli with Psalm 23 on there. It's on every playlist that I have for any Christian music because to this day, that song lifts me up. What was crazy about that experience was not only was I given Psalm 23 as a refuge to go to at that moment in my life, but in the midst of that week, which I, we kind of brought here um, two summers ago when we had our kids do the mission trip here, um, here, when they were staying here at the parish, where we had the week-long um, event where they stayed in the classrooms and we went um, to paint the town purple and painted a couple of different houses. In the midst of that week that I had in Phoenix, Arizona, I had a life-altering experience. So much so that when I went home, my older brother Chris said, who are you? I said, what do you mean, who am I? It's me, your brother Danny. He said, no, who are you? You're smiling. I haven't seen a smile on your face since I can't even remember when. Again, this was the summer between 8th and ninth grade. This was 14, 15 years old, 13, 14 years old. Not only that, but this was back in, again, this is hippie late 90s in the Catholic Church, Back when the WWJD bracelets were a thing. You guys know what I'm talking about? The what would Jesus do? So they gave us each a WWJD bracelet. Put it on, thought nothing of it. Until three years later when I finally took it off because it was tearing. And what I didn't realize, remember how I said I was a cutter before that experience? I put it on that wrist. I didn't realize it until three years later. And so when I take the WWJD bracelet off, what Jesus says to me in the midst of that is, what would Jesus do? He would cover my wounds in the deepest, darkest recesses of your heart where you can't find any hope. Now, I'll tell you that story not to be like, oh my gosh, Father, I'm so, how did you make it through that? By myself, not. I didn't. But I tell that story, A, to give you hope that, hey, if I can make it through, you guys are fine. But also, I know a lot of you guys have kids. And most of your kids are getting to those ages where they become rebellious, which means they've reached at least the age of two. When the first word that they learn is, no. The second word they learn is, why. The third phrase they learn is, why? Because. Because that's the back and forth, isn't it? No. Why? Because. Well, why because? Because I said so. Well, who gave you authority? God did. Well, who cares what God said? You've got to go back and forth on that. Or at least I did as a kid. I'm just kind of that guy. But I say all of that to say, as Chesterton was talking about, when we are really looking for hope, it has to be something that is more than just being positive. It has to be something more than just that glass half full, glass half empty, which is good because I identify as, as a, not as an optimist, but as a pessimist. I am a negative person. You may not see it. I don't talk a lot about it, except for the fact that I say I'm a pessimist, and you're like, really, Father? 
I don't see it. You can't get in here, praise God. You guys can't get in here and can't get in here where I always look for the worst case scenario. And it goes back to that old modus operandi that I have of prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. My problem is I'm so busy preparing for the worst many times, I forget that second half of it, that you've got to hope for the best. I prepare for every possible negative outcome, which sometimes happens, but 99 times out of 100 doesn't. But I only look for what can go wrong. That's where my brain, unfortunately, goes. But when we talk about hope, Thomas Merton said, because he had the virtue of hope, he was able to think in terms larger than just the present moment. Or even to think in terms larger than the present moment, or even the present era. He was able to keep his values in order because he had hope. When I talk about raising our gaze, when I talk about prioritizing those first two commandments that God gave us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, then loving your neighbor as yourself, if you have no desire for hope, that's not going to be balanced in that way. You're like, oh crap, I don't put God first. Does that mean I'm not a hopeful person? It's possible, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it makes it more natural when we are truly balanced, loving God with everything first, then loving our neighbors as ourself, then we can love ourselves and truly have the hope that springs eternal. The problem, though, is most times we are surrounded by such despair, we don't even know where to look. Even though Jesus says, right here, look at me. He's in the tabernacle. In the monstrance, when we have Eucharistic adoration, he was literally front and center. He's the circle that's supposed to lead us into our gaze. But many times we get distracted by lights or the sun coming in through the windows. You ever notice that these sections are normally empty on Sundays or Saturdays when the sun comes down earlier because the sun just hits you right in the face? Happens right there too. It drives me crazy. But we get distracted by those things. Or when kids are running amok and going crazy. Last night, for those that didn't see it on Facebook, we had our first Mass in Spanish for a daily Mass last night. I was hoping for 20 people to show up. Like I had originally set it up in the daily Mass chapel. I said, you know what? No, I'm going to shoot big. We're going to have 50 people show up. 120 people later, (laughs) we had a full church. For those of you who come to Mass on Saturday, we have 110 people come to Mass on Saturday nights. It, it, just to kind of give you a frame of reference. During the first reading, though, I was sitting up here, one of our little kids, I felt like Pope Francis at one moment, one of the little kids was just kind of running back and forth and running back and forth and like testing the limits. And so he's over here, and he's like, And so by the time he gets to here, I'm like, come on up. So he's like, I move the basket over. That's why it's sitting there and not in the chair. And he's like, and then runs back. But I share that story to share that even in his innocence, where he thought he was trying to be rebellious and get in trouble, where did he go? As close as he could get to Christ in the sanctuary. Did he recognize that? Probably not. He was probably just trying to be the rebellious little kid. To me, though, it's the, hey, draw close. Come to me, call all the children to Christ present in the Eucharist or to Christ present in the priest in persona Christi in the sacrament of the liturgy of the Eucharist. Come on in. Now, the parents were mortified, (laughs) didn't even see who it was, and the brother, I think, ended up coming and picking him up and scolding him and walking out and coming back in. But for me, it's the, I don't care, it doesn't bother me. In my last parish, we used to have a nativity set in front of the altar, kind of like we did here, but we had a Fontanini village. If you know anything about Fontanini, the statue is about yay big. Well, I had found someone that made us a heck of a deal. What should have been a $10,000 Fontanini set cost me $300, 400 plus pieces, and it was all just magnified on display in front of the altar. When you see little pieces this big, the kids' eyes 
get big. They're like, oh, I get to go play with the Jesus set. One of the kids actually told me that. It's the Jesus set. I get to go play with that. And so the kid comes running up, and his parents are like, no! And I say, come on up. They're like, Father, they're going to break it. It's like, if you've ever touched a Fontanini statue, if they can break that thing, it's like trying to break, break a tumbler. It's not going to happen. You could run over that thing and back over it. You may be able to light it on fire to melt it. That's about it. Because these things are like, they aren't clay. They aren't plastic, but there's something between them that like you can bend them and they aren't going to break. Kind of cool. Um, but they're statues, mini statues. And so the kids loved it because they got to interact. Many of us learn in different ways. And that's one of the things I think that's important when we look at the faith is that we don't all interact with God the same. For some of us, it's through silence. We feel safe and secure and at peace in silence. I'm not one of those people, if you couldn't tell. I struggle with silence. In fact, I remember we had a seven-day silent retreat in seminary. I made it two days before I went to my spiritual director and said, can I please listen to music? I am getting nothing out of this whatsoever, but my love language with God is not silence. It's praise and worship. I need to be able to communicate with God. If that's what you're looking for on this retreat, for me to grow deeper in my relationship with God, let me use my love language with God, please. It was fantastic thereafter. But each of us, when we learn, we learn differently. Some, sometimes we are people that have to see. We are visual learners. I am both a visual, a hands-on, and an auditory learner. I can't remember what the hands-on is. It's not haptic, but something like that. Um, I'm a visual, an audio, auditory, and a hands-on learner. I have to have all three to truly be able to embrace something. So for me to learn a new language, I had to go to Mexico and have one-on-one -on -one listening to people talk, but also reading along to what they're saying. I learned not only through the one-on-one -on -one in Spanish, I watched TV shows every night for eight weeks, because that's all I could do in Mexico, because it was that, or go out and drink, which I wasn't going to do. But it was, that was really the options, because I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any car or anything, and after it gets dark at night, anywhere, it's like, I don't want to walk out in the streets, no. So I'd go home and I'd watch Friends. I'd never watched this whole series of Friends, so I watched Friends, and it was interesting the longer I watched it, because I'd watch it in English with Spanish subtitles, and then I'd watch it dubbed in Spanish with English subtitles, it's like, <laughs> they translated that wrong. But the only way that I could know that was by practice and practice and practice. And it's the same way with the virtues. When we talk about this virtue of hope, we don't have to always be in that depth of despair to practice hope. Because we remember what, it, what life is like at the darkest moment in our lives. Most of us do. I know I do. I felt hopeless, ironically. I felt like I couldn't turn anywhere. And it was in that hopelessness that the light and hope to the world came to me through his love language with me, music. That we develop these relationships with God based on where we are in our life. Now for me growing up, it was, I like to praise and worship and like, believe it or not, I never had a mass in organ until I became a priest. We had guitars, we had tambourines, which ugh, to this day it's like, oh, come on. I know they're in the Psalms, they were supposed to have tambourines, but really, come on. But we had trumpets. I played the drum set at mass for two years. But some people would say, oh, Father, you cannot have these, mute, these instruments in mass if they help us to involve and be consciously active in the mass, whether it is polyphonic and all you have is a cappella, or you have organ music, or you have guitars, or you have all of the above, ultimately doesn't matter if your heart isn't present. And that's one of the things that many of our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters miss 
with sometimes the praise and worship services. Any church you walk into, no matter what the denomination is, you will always know what the most important facet of their faith and their time together is by what is in the center of the church. For instance, disregard that. (laughs) In the church, what is the central focus? The tabernacle through the altar, or the altar leading us to the tabernacle. Now, typically in a Catholic church, you would also see a crucifix above the altar. Ours is to the side because I wasn't here 20 years ago to say, let's move that down another 15 feet and put the crucifix there. But typically in a Catholic church, you will find the altar in the center. And and as of late, more in the last 15 years, and definitely prior to Vatican II, the, the tabernacle would always be in the center of the church. Now, up until Vatican II, the altar would also be up into the tabernacle. The tabernacle would actually be part of the altar. You'd have those high altars. But as we don't say Mass ad orientum anymore, we say it ad popolo as the norm in the United States, at least, and worldwide. That's why there is that separation then in most churches between the tabernacle and the altar. Now, there are some churches that still celebrate Mass ad orientum. In fact, I've been thinking about playing around with that just to see what would happen, because I'm uncomfortable when I celebrate. I've four times in my life had to celebrate Mass at Orientum. The pilgrimages that I do every year with Father Carl Janoka, the first year as a priest, we went to um, Vienna and Krakow. Beautiful churches, you didn't have an option to do Mass at Popolo, because the altar and the tabernacle were one and the same. It's like, oh, crap, I don't know my lines. So if you didn't know in the Missal, which is what that red book is called, the Roman Missal, it has everything that I say throughout the Mass. Like, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Oh, crap, what's the next line? So I literally go, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your heart. Like, I have to go back and forth because I didn't have it memorized. I've only been a priest for four months. I don't know the words. No, I've been to Mass every week of my life, but if you've never been to Mass as the only person there besides Father, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you've been the only person there, you're like, oh, I'm supposed to say something? Uh, and also with you, oh no, they changed that a decade ago, what is it now? Like you get flustered. And so that's what happened to me when I had Mass at Oriental, my first year as a priest. Now I've got a little bit better because now I've got to do it in Spanish. El Señor esté con ustedes y con tu espíritu. Levantemos el corazón. Levantan, uh, some response in there. I, I can't do it off of memory. Like if I'm in the moment with other people, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Or I can read it. That's what the cheat sheets are all for. But all of that to say, when we go into a place of worship, we see who it is we're worshiping. Here, we're worshiping the living God, the triune God, body, blood, soul, and divinity present in the Eucharist. And many of our non-Catholic Christian brother and sister churches, it's about the preacher, because they'll have the ambo front and center, or they'll have the music front and center. And that was kind of where my relationship was with God growing up. It was all about the praise and worship. And man, this was prior to Matt Marr and all the great music that he brought to us. And then I learned in seminary there's a difference between praise and worship, and liturgical proper hymns for Mass. There are some music that is just awesome, that lifts my spirit up to God, but that shouldn't be used during the Mass. And I'm like, oh, so like everything has the right purpose. Like everything is ordered properly. Like, but there are also some songs that we like the tune of that we don't listen to the words of. In fact, one of them we heard on the radio for the last month and a half, and my response every time is, yes, she knew. You know what song I'm talking about? Mary, did you know? Yes, she knew! The angel came to her and told her what was going to happen! She knew! But it's a beautiful song, right? Mary, did you know that your baby... Yes, she did. But I can't tell you how many people... Oh, Father, we should play that during Mass. No! 
It's not going to be played during Mass. Oh, but it's such a pretty song. So is the devil went down to Georgia, but we're not playing it during Mass. I mean, that's, not a, that's, not, that's a horrible representation, but there's other songs that are beautiful songs, but they don't belong in the liturgy of the Eucharist. Now, there's some songs that are good for praise and worship that are specifically for, like, adoration. So um, there, there's a lot of retreats that our youth are invited to, like the National Catholic Youth Conference that we went to, um, not this past year, but the year before in Indianapolis that we're hoping to go to again this year in Indianapolis with our high school kids. Some of the music they use during Mass, they come back to church and it's like, oh man, this music was so cool. And we come back and we hear, holy God, we praise thy name. They're like, why can't we have this? It's like, because you have to have a both and. You can't just have the organ and you can't just have the praise and worship. You have to have that give and take of both. We're growing into that spiritually and every parish does it a little bit differently. All of this to say, wherever you find yourself in life, where do you seek solace? Because that's a very important question. Where do you find hope when everything is going wrong? That's an important question because for many in the world, God doesn't make the top ten list. For instance, if you're having a bad day, what is the first thing that you want to do? Some people, it's, I want to turn the TV on. Some people, it's, I want to go and have a nice dinner with my spouse. Some people, it's, I want to go have a nice cocktail. Some people, it's, I need to escape, I want to go to the casino. Some people, we, you see where I'm going with this, right? that many things that end up in addictions are addictions because those are places where we've found comfort that only offer us temporal, timely, short-lasted comfort. That's where alcoholism, drug addicts, porn addictions, sex addictions, gambling addictions, any addictions come from when we put something in front of our relationship with God. Now, you guys are probably all saying, there's like, oh, crap. I don't go to God when I'm in despair. That, that, okay, we, we're working on it. We're getting there. But that's an important question to ask yourself, not saying that you go to addictions, but I also know that many people have addictions that they don't talk about. That's what makes it an addiction. <laughs> because when you talk about addictions, you talk about control. That's why many times I talk about the divine mercy image, which I have hanging in my office. I've got it hanging right under the clock for me, which is not the right time ever. And it reminds me from the words that are under it, Jesus, I trust in you. Because I have to remind myself sometimes that I have distractions that I put into my life that don't truly give me life, but really sap my energy. I love football. If you didn't know that by now, you haven't been paying attention. I love my sports. My 49ers making it to the playoffs. They're going to beat the Seahawks on Saturday. I'm doing Exodus 90. No TV, no video games, no electronics, really. No sports. So that's a sacrifice to focus on what really matters. Because I want to watch that game. I want to watch the Seahawks lose for the third time this year to my 49ers. I wanted to watch TCU gang up on Georgia Monday night. Obviously, nobody watched that game because TCU got destroyed by Georgia, 63-7. to oh, That hurts my Big 12 heart. But many times... Those are the things we look to as distractions. If you have your show that you have to watch, I have to watch my shows, or you have that specific go-to attitude or go-to thing, some people, they work out as their addiction. That's not me. Part of mine is I nap. Does anybody like to nap? Oh, I love it. 
it's amazing that as a kid, all you want to do is no nap. As a parent, yes, please. Give me 20 minutes. That's all I need. Now I take like an hour and a half, but still. We want to find those things that give us comfort. For me, it's more of the, my brain is fried. (laughs) If I don't close my eyes, I'm going to be useless. So this afternoon, I took a nap. I woke up and I felt absolutely useless. So what did I do? I went to my chapel. It's one of the benefits I have living across the street. (laughs) But also, I didn't go to this chapel. I didn't come here in the church. I have a chapel in the house. Do you have a place at home that you can call your place with God? If not, I recommend it. What did Jesus say to us? Go to the inner room of your house. Close that door. He's not telling you to lock yourself in the basement. He's not telling you to lock yourself in the storm shelter or the cellar. He's not trying to even tell you to lock yourself in the closet. What he's trying to say is find that place where you can blot out all the distractions and just be with God. Find that place in your house. And if you want me to help you find a place, let me know. If you want me to come and bless an altar that you want to put there where you can have as your prayer time, let me know. I'll come and do it. Or Deacon can come and do it. Just signed you up. Uh, (laughs) But that's what we're called to do. We have to, as a community of faith, come together and see what our needs are, not our wants. I want to have a diet, Dr. Pepper. Eleven It's been 11 days since I've had anything but the thing that actually gives us life and provides for us. You ever notice how tasteless water is? But it still quenches thirst. So much better than those diet sodas do. But man, I love my diet sodas. 12 days since I've had a drink of alcohol. Now, that may be like, oh, Father, are you an alcoholic? No, no, no. But I like to have, I like scotch, I like beer, I like wine. I'm old enough, I can have a drink. But people are like, oh, but Father, we've got a funeral dinner. Dennis made his sofa pee a cheesecake. Want a piece? Yes, I do. In 79 more days. Because there's no desserts during this 90-day ascetical journey as well. Depriving ourselves of those things that we want, that we don't need, helps us get to that foundational place where we have nowhere to escape to but to God. It's the healthy way to find that valley of despair. Because we feel like, there's nothing to live for now. I don't get to watch TV. I don't get to play on my phone. I can't even have dessert. No dessert. Snacks, no cookies, no diet soda, no coffee. I don't drink coffee anyway, so that doesn't bother me. But all of these things that we see that give us so much life ironically distract us from what's really important. So when I woke up from my nap this afternoon, I went to my chapel, prayed evening prayer because it was after four, and then listened to the Bible in a year and the catechism in a year, And then got ready for tonight's talk. All of this to say, hope makes it possible for us to remain faithful. When we talk about faith, kind of the next level up is finding not just what we intellectually know, not just what we spiritually can hold on to. It's not the what, it's the why. Why do we put ourselves contrary to the world? The world that says, oh, all you need is more money. But then the richest people in the world sometimes are the most unhappy people in the world. Because what they placed value in didn't actually give them any solace or any comfort. Many times in life, we just need a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. You know what that sounds like? Sounds like an addiction, doesn't it? I 
I just need a little bit more alcohol or just a little bit more pornography or just a little bit more drugs to get the same high. If I just have a little bit more, my family will be more comfortable. I think I've told this story before, but I think it's worth telling again in this context. I had a priest in seminary, Father Ron Knott, who had been a pastor of this parish for 20 years, and they made a deal with his bishop that he made a deal with his parish. He got permission from the bishop first, and he said, I will make a deal with any family that's willing to sign this contract. If you faithfully give your 10% to the parish for this year, and you sign on this dotted line, if you find yourself wanting at the end of the year, I will refund your full year worth of tithe. Of which the collective mouths of all the seminarians went, it's like, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Because, <laughs> I mean, if you think about, if you make $100,000, I've got to find $10,000 now on my budget that I've got to give back. I've got to be willing to give back $10,000 for every $100,000 if these people are found wanting at the end? And he said, you didn't hear what I said. I've been doing this for 20 years, gentlemen. Not once has anyone who's made that commitment in faith been found wanting at the end of the year? Of which our mouths dropped even further. Because we too sometimes as priests get cynical. We get cynical when we look and say, man, our budget is $300,000 here at the parish. That's awesome. That's awesome that we are that generous here at the parish. And that is, I'm not, I'm not belittling any of that. But when you multiply that out, that means the GDP of the parish is $3 million. Which if you divide that by the 400 people that come to Mass, not families, but people that come to Mass, that means on average we make between ten and $15,000 per person a year. If that's the 10%. Now, I know that's not true because I know for myself, I make more than that. I make double that. I make $24,000 a year as a priest. Now, there are some other perks like we get mileage because I have to drive back and forth all the time. I've put 95,000 miles on my car in four years because now that I'm out here, it's not just driving between here and Sayre. It's driving here, Sayre, and Oklahoma City. Or tomorrow morning, because we still don't have a chaplain down at the Granite, Granite uh, Prison, I'm driving down to Granite tomorrow morning to celebrate Mass for the prisoners, both in the medium security and minimum security prison, then to drive back up here, then to drive to Sayre to celebrate Mass. That we have all of these different things. And what's crazy is I drive less miles a month than we have total square mileage in our parish boundaries. Do you know what our parish boundaries are here at the parish? Technically. Mile marker 60 to the border. Halfway between here and Woodward. So 45 miles north. Halfway between here and Mangum. 20 miles south. So 60 by 65. Do it easy, 60 by 60. 3,600 square miles is our parish boundaries. I drive half of that a month. But there are needs within every mile of those 3,600 square miles. And that's where we are all being called to give back, of our time, of our talent, and of our treasure. Oh no, Father went off of hope and he's talking about tithing. Don't worry, it'll only take a second. All of this to see... Where our hope is, is where we store up our treasure. And many times when we aren't feeling hopeless, that's when we hold on to the gifts that God has given to us. And I'm, I'm not talking about tithing at this point. We have so many great and talented people here at the parish. I even brought this up last night at the Mass in Spanish. It's like, guys, soy gringo. I am a gringo. <laughs> but I'm trying to learn Spanish because I know many of our parishioners don't understand English. Well, they need to learn English, Father. That's neither here nor there. Where they currently are, they don't. 
And because of that, I as priest am called to do more. I wish I could learn Vietnamese. Father Len Bui tried to teach me, even to count to ten. Mot hai bot bon. That's about as far as I can get. One, two, three, four. That's as far as I can get. I tried. If I ever get placed at the cathedral in Oklahoma City, I need Father Tang to teach me Vietnamese. Because <laughs> they aren't going to send me to Vietnam to, to learn Vietnamese. In fact, the reason I got an associate at my last parish from Myanmar is because in the country of Myanmar, Burma, there are 36 tribal languages in the country. None of them talk to each other. Burmese, the language, is not a unifier like Swahili is in Africa and like Spanish is in a lot of these Spanish-speaking countries. It is the elitist language. So I had to find a priest from the community of languages that the refugees that came to our parish came from to be able to even celebrate Mass in their language. Luckily, God set it all up. We had a priest in Tulsa, Father Robert Kim Po, who would be coming down once a month, who was a classmate of Father um, Titus Pau, who I found when their bishop came to visit us. And he said, Father Danny, how can I help you help my people? It was beautiful that he said, my people, not your people. Because he's still, even though they're literally half a world away, because they were from his country as refugees, he still wanted to relate with them. How can I help you help my people? I said, I need a priest to speak the language. They need the mass. I can do that. It's like, oh, what? <laughs> Jaw dropped. So when we met with Archbishop Coakley and he said, okay, okay, I'll give you a priest. Archbishop went, what did he just say? He said, he said he's offering us a priest, which is more valuable than gold these days in the church in Oklahoma because we have so few priests. But not only did he offer us a priest, he offered us his vicar general, his right-hand man. Their diocese was 10 years old at the time. They had never even built a pastoral center. Father Titus has been ordained for 10 years longer than I have. He spent seven of those years in Italy. So he's never had a class in Spanish in his life, but he can speak Italian. So when COVID shut us down, we had four masses every weekend live streamed. We only had three masses when we didn't have live streaming because we had it in four different languages. I did English. I did Spanish. Father Titus did Zopau, which is the tribal language that they use, and Italian. Because if you remember early on in COVID, the priests in Italy were the priests that got hit the hardest early on. They had over 100 priests die from COVID in the first six months. And so his old parishioners called and said, Father, we have nobody even to go to Mass online. Can you offer from Oklahoma City... <laughs> a mass for us once a week in Italian. So Corpus Christi, Oklahoma City, celebrated mass in Italian, Spanish, Zopau, and English for a year live streamed. All of that because I had nowhere to go but to God. I'm not saying that to tout myself up, I'm not. I really am not. But to say that the Lord will provide when you're looking for what is necessary. Last night, I was blown away. I keep talking about it because I'm still trying to comprehend it. I'd, mass of Our Lady of Guadalupe is normally the biggest mass in Spanish that we have a year. We had 67 people this last year because it was the same day as everyone else because it was the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Last year we had about 150 because we had it the day after because it was on a Sunday. And I was not doing the Sunday masses and then that after. No, no, no. We're going to do it tomorrow. So we had a big showing last year. I was really excited. And we had 67 come then this year. And it's like, oh, I thought we had more than this. Maybe I shouldn't start a Mass in Spanish throughout the week because obviously there's not a need. No, but I said I was going to start it. Let me start it and see what happens. 120 people came last night. We have two kids 
because of last night, enrolled in RCIC tonight. That'll be receiving all the sacraments at Easter. I've got two more marriage preps that I'm working on because of last night. We got to talk, Christina. <laughs> We've got four more kids besides those in our RE classes tonight. Just because I listened to God. Imagine how the world would change if each and every one of us put our fears by the wayside and said, Lord, what is it that you need? How can you use me to better the church of God in western Oklahoma, to better the world around me? It doesn't take a lot to love. It doesn't take a lot to forgive. It just takes everything. (laughs) By everything, I mean everything that we put in place of it. Our wants, our fears, our desires. But do we really need those things? How do we shed ourselves of those things that we really don't need to get back to that thing that can truly give us each not only a good life here, no matter what we face, but life eternal? I talked about the catechism in a year. If you're listening to the Bible in a year podcast, which I highly recommend if you haven't started either one of them, do it. They're both fantastic. But right now we're in the book of Genesis and in the most depressing book ever in Scripture, the book of Job. Job is crying out to God saying, What the heck, man? All I've done is give everything to you, and you have taken everything from me. Now, in the beginning, he says, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Which his wife is like, really? He took literally everything away. He's like, well, that's fine. He gave me everything in the first place. But then he gave him boils. And it's like, all right, Lord, (laughs) taking things from me is one thing. Giving me something I don't want, that's a completely different story. When we have those infirmities that actually attack us, then we're like, all right, come on, Lord. I understand that a small smidgen. When I started having my neck issues a year and a half ago, and it's like, Lord, I, I feel the weight of the world on me, and now literally I feel the weight of the world on my neck. I can't move. I can't function. Give me some release. And I wasn't able to find it in prayer. And I'm like, Lord, what is going on? I would have three epidurals in my neck and still have pain. But at this point, it's like, okay, I can function. I can function with this pain. I can offer this pain up. I can use it to give me motivation. I can use it as an example of saying, you know what, life's not perfect, but God offers hope. So I'm going to end there on hope tonight. We'll pick it up again next week. I've got about two more pages of hope, probably two more classes on hope. Then we'll go to love about the time that Lent starts. Perfect timing. (laughs) Any questions before we end with prayer? Algunas preguntas antes oración? Okay, let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for all, all that you've given to us for the good and the bad, for all of those opportunities that you've placed before us that we have embraced, and for all of those opportunities that we haven't yet recognized or have turned our backs on, we give you praise and thanksgiving for. We pray that wherever our hearts are this evening, you help us to turn back to you. You help us to grow and seek the true peace and joy and hope of the world that is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this evening. Allow these words and stories from tonight to help us to find our own stories and our own ability to witness to your love in our lives. We ask all these things through your mother's name, As we pray through her intercession, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, 
Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. See you guys next week.